morning. It's uh, January the 5th, 2019. Happy New Year to all of you. Welcome to the show on the FATU Network, uh, Africa Focus on Education here on the FATU Network once again. Uh, it is uh, about 43, 43 degrees cloudy uh, in the Maryland area. The time is 11.50 Eastern Standard Time and that would be 10.50 uh, Central in Dallas uh, and 8.50 in Los Angeles and that would be 4.50 p.m. in London and Banjul and 5.50 p.m. in Berlin and Paris. Uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, joining us today on, uh, on this program. Uh, as we've done in the past, uh, we will be celebrating three years, uh, uh, believe it or not, tomorrow, uh, January the 6th was exactly the day that I launched this program uh, after working uh, in the background with Fatu uh, herself and uh, Juka Sisi, my sister, Juka Sisi, both of them, and you know, coming up with this program because of uh, what I have seen in uh, the area underground uh, in the Detroit uh, metro area with family members, especially those from Senegal who were just looking for help. And we had a lot of, we have a lot of teachers um, from Senegal in, in, in the Detroit area and in the whole entire United States uh, from Gambia. There's teachers all over the place, uh, people teaching in colleges, in the universities and in elementary school, high school and middle school. But um, uh, I think sometimes people just don't either know things or perhaps they haven't gotten uh, to know somebody or perhaps they just don't feel they want to bother anyone and they decided there was no need for me to approach uh, somebody uh, to talk about my problems. And so uh, this is how it all came about. So I'll talk a little bit about the history of why I felt the need of being on the air uh, to talk about uh, uh, education and, and especially on a Saturday. Uh, so we can all get to learn a little bit more about uh, the founding of how we ended up doing what we've been doing. I've been doing this for three years now. I've, I've missed some Saturdays, but there were reasons for all of that. I just feel like if uh, we had extra help or uh, the support uh, to be able to do this, people should be talking about education every day. That's how I feel uh, because we are so... Uh, uh, we're so much under pressure. There's a lot of challenges for us in the continent of Africa. I'm not talking about the other countries that are successful, even though uh, here in the United States, I mean, they're they fine tuning and doing better after all these years of success, successes. Uh, but uh, I think we, we kind of need it more right now because everybody is looking towards Africa. They're waiting to see when uh, the African continent will begin to rise up and, you know, uh, stop begging uh, and, and asking for loans and support. Uh, and I think that would minimize the amount of money that these countries are sacrificing giving us uh, as a continent. And which is why uh, our responsibilities are becoming more of a liability. And I'll talk about that later uh, in the program. But uh, just to start, Manglin Anu, Dylan Santa Dylan Girem, Sol Baji Fiji Fatu Network, Dylan Yan Al Jama, in this jama, Andrew jama, Dega jama, this jama, uh, Ewa jama. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, having Ibrahim Asizeh. Uh, last week we didn't have enough time uh, because he came in a little late and he wasn't feeling very well. Uh, but hopefully, inshallah, today he'll come and share with us all of his experiences from Banjo, uh, what he's learned uh, during the time of his stay uh, in Banjo as a result, and, and many of the things that he came across and, and, and thought he can share with all of us so we can all learn uh, and and kind of uh, understand what the challenges are. Again, as if we don't know what our challenges are, but we do. Uh, but sometimes the, the way we approach to get more information really does matter. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Ibrahim would be able to give us his perspective. Uh, he's been to Gambia quite a bit, even during the Ajame era, uh, just doing his thing and, and getting information. People have heard him talk on the network, not just ours. I think he has been on uh, Pandere's network and Gainaco and, and other platforms where he can share and spread information uh, so we can all understand what our problems are back home. So I look forward to having Ibrahim join me uh, to talk to us about that. Um, filtering, 
like I said, I mean, there's always information. Uh, if you are in the uh, education sector, uh, as I feel, I should, there's a need for you uh, to kind of, you know, listen, share information with your classroom students most of the time uh, by just telling them a story or something on the news. Uh, I read something on the newspaper. Or <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, because of cold weather, uh, sometimes we get all of these, um, you know, <coughs> rusty uh, kind of voices, which has been uh, going on for a while. But I'm grateful my allergies are not as bad as they used to be. So that's, uh, that's something to be thankful for. Uh, but early hours of the morning, this happens all the time. Um, what I was saying about, uh, you know, getting information. If you're teaching, you just don't teach the kids about uh, the subjects that, you know, your curriculum has given you. There's so many other things you have to teach them uh, in the classroom, you know, social norms. Uh, if, you, if you're a man, how do you uh, uh, respectfully talk to a woman? Uh, if you're a woman, how do you respectfully talk to a man? And the problem usually is the man who, uh, you know, don't usually usually approach men uh, in a respectful manner. We live in an environment where we really need to kind of educate our young men and women about dress codes, uh, how to how to dress. I mean, kids walk with pants uh, almost uh, on their knees, and they keep pulling them. They think that's nice, but what's the history behind that? Perhaps they need to know how it all started. So uh, to dress, uh, to make sure that if you're going to look for a job, I mean, you need to start learning those things from elementary school, uh, making sure you uh, wake up in the morning, take a shower, apply some deodorant, brush your teeth, uh, how you communicate with people, don't make fun of others, be respectful of people in your environment and people you talk to, pasture. Should you sit down on the chair straight? Should you sit down and just you know, kind of uh, bend over or uh, uh, lean towards some other way. How do you communicate with people? And most of the time, the kids don't understand that uh, your body language speaks volume than your what you say. I mean, you can sugarcoat things when you're saying things. But if you if you don't want people to know what's going on, sometimes they just say, you know, not a problem, everything is fine. But People look at you, they can tell from your face, your body language, and how you communicate besides just saying things. Uh, so they can tell whether you're somebody who are respectful. Are you, if you're talking to uh, uh, a group of people, should you put your hands together in front of you, behind you, fold your arms, uh, put them on the side, uh, all of these things. Should you open your feet when you're talking to people? All of those things are observed by people who are specialized in that. And many of the teachers use, they learn these signs. They can tell if a child is under stress sometimes over a time of experience. They can understand that um, uh, something is not right. So all of these things do happen for uh, obvious reasons. Yep. Um, I'm sorry uh, for that pause there for a minute. Uh, but uh, what is happening in, in life is there's so many things we can all learn from. And so, uh, which is why I take time sometimes to listen and read some of these articles. Anything that I hear that has something to do with education, uh, I take my time to listen to and I learn and I share it on this platform. Uh, but I can't say everything. There's just so much information out there. But you know, the, the, the level at which information is being shared these days is fast. You got Twitter, you got social media, such as Facebook, uh, the newspapers themselves online, newspaper newspapers, um, articles, the um, magazines, uh, uh, international news. There's so much information out there. So sometimes you just got to pick what you think. Uh, if you hear something and you think, oh, this is good. So I make my choices because I don't have all day to be on the air uh, to talk to uh, each and every one of you. But I mean, the little that I can grasp, that's what I can bring over here. So we find information that's reliable and well-researched from credible sources uh, or outlets that aren't biased and discuss them on this platform, uh, especially information that's affecting us um, as people here in the diaspora or our families back home. Uh, because this, this, whatever we learn from uh, this information really has implications for us. And uh, what we do here has serious implications back home, and we would act kind, um, locally and think globally. 
So if you'd like to join the conversation as I normally start the program with, um, you can uh, call in those numbers, uh, US 706454330, Sweden 08519-72099, UK uh, 02035751188, uh, or you can try the Skype, the Skype um, address, which is Fatu Radio Live. Fatu Radio Live. Just like I said, uh, listeners can call uh, these numbers um, if you'd like to listen. 712 for US, uh, 712-432-6906, Germany 221-988-8088, Spain 911-196725, France 33181-220680, Italy. 0289982281 and the UK would be 44330 or you can download the Fatu Network app live on your uh, phone and maybe an iPad and listen to it anytime um, uh, on the go. So what are we doing for those kids who show up at school every day with inadequate resources? Uh, we can't expect them to perform at the same level as those kids who have all the resources they would ever need. Uh, that's the phrase that I usually begin my program with. That's Lawrence O'Donnell's phrase. Uh, that's the host of MSNBC's The Last Word. Uh, he uses this phrase for obvious reasons because he's been participating in funding and supporting the Malawi uh, girls uh, in Malawi uh, with a program called KIND, K-I-N-D. That's Kids in Need of Desks. Uh, so if you like to support, especially with the tax season coming up, uh, the best place, I think, for you to help make a difference out of all the other places. I mean, you can do that for homeless uh, 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 support or uh, soup chicken, uh, kitchen, sorry, that where they kind of uh, provide uh, food and maybe support for families that are struggling or maybe at a hospital. Uh, but I think schools are important. Education is so fundamental that it makes a huge difference in a person's life. And we're going to be talking about some of those things that have changed people as a result. And so, yes, you can probably split your donation between these organizations, but give something towards KIND, K-I-N-D, uh, and make a difference in the life of a young lady or a young man um, uh, in Africa. Because when Africa is strong, I always believe, and I have believed that, and I will continue to believe that it, Africa is able to lift it itself, to cut down on the corruption, cut down on the misuse of power, and, and, and you know, strengthen those institutions. So we do need strong leaders for sure, uh, but we need those institutions to be strong. Why do I say we need strong leaders? So strong leaders would be able to help make sure that people who may be engaged in corruption uh, would, do, uh, would be found wanting. But if you're a strong leader and you have those leadership skills, so the first thing you do is you lead by example. Um, just like the Maslow laws, I mean, where you make sure that you're a, a leader that people can look forward to, uh, servant leaders. A servant leader is somebody who serves the people. You know that you're not going to be earning a lot of money, but you're giving back your time and energy and your expertise to make a difference in the lives of the people of your country. Uh, such that maybe at a time where you leave uh, things better than how you found them. Uh, you can go out and be a, speak, uh, a, speecher, a speaker, sorry, you can have uh, public speeches, um, you can uh, have private speeches with international organizations, private companies, and make a lot of money. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that because you've given your time to make a difference in the lives of your people. And so people would like to know, what do you talk about in your cabinet? Uh, inside behind closed doors. Uh, what kind of strategies have you come up with, for instance, in our home country, Gambia? So these are, these are things that are important in terms of making sure that uh, our families or people will have uh, better lives because we have the leaders who can articulate and be able to communicate and be able to uh, negotiate and, and have all of these stents uh, uh, given and the powers given to institutions that can help them deliver those goods. Uh, if you have the legal system where uh, the courts and the judiciary will prosecute maybe a, a cabinet member who has involved themselves in criminal activity and, and you know, make sure they have to do um, whatever their rights are, are protected, they can have a legal uh, 
uh, representation, but the courts are not biased because it's a strong institution. Uh, so if they find somebody wanting, then they'll be able to bring him to book. Uh, but once make sure your prison system is is up to date uh, uh, on international standards. Maybe human rights groups can come in and say, for you to have a prison system that would be considered uh, humane, these are the conditions that you need to meet. Why? Because they have experience, they know what you need. And you meet those uh, uh, standards and then you call them to come in and do an inspection and they say, okay, your prison system is up to pass and now it's fine. And then when people are being uh, 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 maybe uh, prosecuted and ready to go to jail, the chances are they'll be, they'll be going through the, the due process, uh, how many years they have to spend to make sure that they're fed, they're taken care of, all of those things that the human rights groups really advocate for. Uh, you do those things and then you go to your Ministry of Education, make sure your children have the best possible education. The curriculum systems are up. So all of these institutions actually help you deliver the goods that not only your citizens would appreciate, but the international, international community can look at you and say, this is what we want. So uh, moving to the area of education, uh, many schools are open. Uh, the rest of the schools are probably going to be opening most likely on Monday. Uh, um, and then that brings us into midway into the school year. Um, so that that's it. We've, we've been going this fast, uh, and it's unbelievable. Before you know it, April gets here, May, and then schools are closed in June. Uh, some schools will close early May or late May, uh, depending on what state you are in. Uh, but I mean, these are things that are going to happen so fast. So. Uh, we need to stay informed. We need to stay on top of everything that's happening. Um, and so it's important for us to pay attention to not only elementary school uh, and uh, middle or high school. We need to pay attention to colleges. Um, so I'll begin with the colleges a little bit uh, here. Like I said, um, one of the reasons why I got into doing what I've been doing uh, for us in our community, and many people benefit from it, uh, some don't because they don't need it. They know everything else they need, or perhaps they just don't need all that information, or maybe they don't feel like uh, this is the right place to get the information. They may have a better avenue to get information. Um, but the people who have benefited from it as a result is what I had been involved in at uh, Wayne State University for all those years, um, from 2009 going all the way to 2017, um, not 17, but 15, uh, when they changed the rules. Uh, but I had no idea. I, I attended that school and have lived in Detroit for all those years until my son was just about ready to go to college. Around 2009 was when I realized that there is this program available now that's uh, actually helping um, uh, children uh, who are in uh, the uh, junior and going into the senior year that they can apply for um, scholarship awards awards programs all over the state and even out of state. Um, students were applying for uh, admission and I didn't know that, but they were doing that all over the state, like I said, and they'll send in the applications to uh, be in the uh, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Urban Reed's uh, College of Education, um, which was, Urban Reed uh, was the, the uh, what do you call it again, the president uh, of the school uh, while I was going to school and he retired, he retired. and when he retired um, I'm sure there were programs available but this program was tailored towards him and they had other programs but this was a program that I had exposure to and what they did was students would send in their application uh, and the school, the university would go back and look at the criteria uh, that they have set uh, for accepting students who apply for scholarship. Uh, they had to have a certain GPA. Most of the students who had the opportunity to get accepted for those scholarships are students who get engaged in not only just academia, extracurricular activity, maybe sports, uh, whatever, music, anything, art that you're doing, uh, or more importantly, invol involved in the community, volunteering their time. Uh, soup kitchens, uh, going to a homeless shelter, uh, volunteering at the YMCA, or maybe during the summer, uh, 
doing other extracurricular things. Maybe you are a co-op. You go to a company like Delphi, which is a supply company, automotive supply company. Maybe you've worked there. You might be earning a little bit of money, not much, but because you're exposed to people skills. Uh, so the university had a broad list of things that they were looking at that gave them a good idea as to whether your child is ready to go to college. Um, and so those were the criteria that they had. Uh, they had a whole lot more. But what I was exposed to was <clears throat> what they were looking for. GPA attendance. Of course, a student's attendance in school is important. Uh, but uh, what is important is they have to have uh, no record of disciplinary to an extent that is uh, kind of exorbitant. I mean, if a child had some discipline, uh, records of discipline, yes, but other things, I mean, you have to be well-mannered. Like I said, uh, behavior is the key. Um, so the school would look into all of that. Um, so your letter would count. Um, they'll look at how you articulate yourself, the story that you're explaining. We've talked about Louisiana, how, you know, some of those uh, school, uh, uh, teachers were helping students kind of write their letter and their stories. If your story is telling and it's uh, uh, kind of uh, interesting or important enough uh, based on your family, maybe you're the first child, uh, first generation uh, of um, going to college. Those are all key areas that they look for. You might call them maybe green lights that actually attract uh, the university to say, uh, okay, that's a potential candidate. Uh, maybe you have a single parent or your parents, unfortunately, uh, are diseased or you're raised by your grandparents and all of that. The challenges that are there for a child to kind of struggle, but you've overcome all of those challenges. Those are the things that the school is looking for. Yes, you have a good GPA, but you're involved in other things. You're tutoring and mentoring kids in your community. All of those things count. They help the school uh, uh, actually better make the decision. Now, uh, they invite you to come in. Uh, a lot of students come in. I mean, they'll do this program of interviewing kids. They would do it in December, uh, I remember, and then in February uh, as well. The whole weekend, Saturday and Sunday, uh, students will come in. We're like talking about thousands of kids that come into the school from not just in the state of Michigan, but they come in from out of state. Um, and they come in and we interview these kids. Uh, we volunteer as alumni. I have engaged with, you know, people who have been attorneys, you know, big names in the city of Detroit, uh, but they graduated from the university. It was a volunteer work of free of charge. The only thing we had was lunch and breakfast and they'll feed us pretty good. But we would interview these young men and women in groups so we would have two of us um, as the interviewees uh, or interviewers who would sit down and then the students would be probably eight or six of them. They'll all sit in a table, uh, a round table with us. We've never met them. And then we'll begin to ask questions about them, that they'll explain to us who they are, what they've done, uh, and why do they want to come to the university? What are they looking forward to? So kids will give you stories and you'll grade them based on those stories. At the end of which the kids leave and we sit down and we make a decision of uh, how we pick. So uh, some of the things that happen, I, I can't go into the details of all of that because then again, the university would be like, okay, I mean, but the kids know these things. So, uh, but the grades are given uh, based on so much criteria. And I think it's important, the reason I'm sharing this story, for families who are in the Michigan area to look at other universities, yes, but also Wayne State, and, and find out what programs they have. If you have a child that's in 11th grade, now is the time for you to find out from your school and from the university what programs they offer scholarships for. Here's the icing on, on the cake. Scholarships offered by Wayne State can range up to $40,000. $40,000 uh, for these young men and women um, <clears throat> at a minimum if you attend the Scholars Day program which is the Scholars that's the event if you're invited you will get some money no matter what uh, sometimes 8000 it all depends the school chooses what they think you uh, that you should, you should be able to get based on the gradings uh, from the interview and the criteria that they set uh, for 
accepting students. Some students will get 40,000, some may get something in between. That's the school's decision that I have never gotten involved in, um, in many ways. But the recommendations that we give are really taken seriously because the school knows that it is unbiased. Uh, we never met these kids. Um, so kids would explain their beautiful stories, uh, but the money is what is important. If you can save yourself from having to fund your child's education at college, that's the goal. That's what I want to make sure that you know, we can take away from this as parents, making sure that uh, we provide our kids all the support they need. So uh, how do you get to that interview? Making sure kids do a, a good amount of time reading. The SAT scores would count. ACT scores would count. Uh, but if you can't read and you can't write, so how would any school actually look at you as a potential candidate? So that's a problem. That's the reason why we want to make sure that our children are prepared. So exams are coming up. These things are a little different now. Uh, every university is looking at your child from probably third grade all the way to 12th grade because states have these exams that they administer and universities can access that information because they want to be prepared so they can start looking at potential candidates they can begin to write letters to. Um, if your child is in 10th grade or 11th grade and your child is performing well, you can bet by now you're getting letters from universities trying to you know, find out if they can offer your child some scholarship, maybe invite them. So that's important. The other thing about college uh, before we go down to elementary and middle school is when you get admitted in college, you want to make sure that your child really picks what they want to learn, okay, from the get-go. And, and as parents, don't force your child because you might end up paying more. Why? Because if a kid ends up getting to a point where they don't like that, that, that subject matter um, or they don't want to uh, study an area that somehow you tend to agree or force them to, to take, uh, when they lose that confidence uh, and they're not enthusiastic about that subject, uh, then uh, they're going to either fail those classes or refuse to continue. And then they'll, they'll go back to square one. What is good for schools is they usually allow the students to begin with the, uh, the core subjects, uh, which are requirements. Those are no matter what you will have to do, the social studies, the uh, histories, government, and all that stuff, math and reading, those have to be done no matter what. Okay. So if a student starts to take those classes uh, for the first two years before they get into the program, that actually helps. But trust me, once you get into a program, some of the subjects you're going to be taking, obviously these are like four or five classes I just mentioned. You need to be able to take other classes alongside uh, with those uh, uh, prerequisites or core, comp core classes that you're taking. Uh, and so if you spend a year or two doing it and then you want to change your program, the university is not going to come and say, all right, so uh, you don't have to pay anything. We'll wipe this up. These are your decisions that you make. So make sure that they are uh, good decisions that you make about your child um, so that you don't have to pay extra money. Now, they may have a scholarship, but once that scholarship kicks in and the child is doing a certain program, that's it. If they want to change and go do something else, that's going to be a problem. So making sure you talk to the counselors, I would recommend, I mean, even those of us who are older, I got dinged, the people I know got dinged because you talk to one counselor, they tell you this is the program available. Uh, you need to go get a second opinion, set up an appointment, go talk to a different counselor, get a third opinion if possible, then come back and bring all this information and see where all of them agree in terms of uh, the things you need to do. Uh, because they may be from different schools of thought, even though that's what they're doing. Uh, and the reason I say that is make sure you keep that information so that tomorrow when something happens, you can bring that up. Schools are not perfect. They're not they're all human beings just like you and I. Uh, and sometimes they may tell you something and then things may change. You may get some communication that comes from the school telling you that we've changed the program a little bit. Pay attention to all of that. This is an investment for you and your family. Uh, and so making sure you get that information and continue to study whatever field you've taken. Once the decision is made, 
don't change it because it will end up costing you a lot of money and you don't want that um, so that's important so these are key areas that are, are important when it comes to where your student or your child is going to go to school I mean <laughs> we've already played and said those clips most of the time now the recommendation would be go to a community college because it's cheaper but if you have a child who's performing well and they're going to be offered a full scholarship whether they're going to be going to uh, Syracuse in New York or whatever let them go to school okay the kids are going to grow to a certain point where they really don't need you but if you've prepared your child getting them involved in people skills and all of that I say rest, rest easy let your child go but have that discussion with your partner and make sure that the, the decision that you make is one these are challenging times moms will not want their children to be far away from them I'm going to speak in our language Kepko uh, hamnelanga am dom te mui wara dem university or college so neke borom ker nanga tok watana so so nangen ham ban decision gen jel um yeah you sometimes na nyowa he nya yora nga fanga dañ na hari dere dede yal no lalen bile ñom bu ngeen domi dem fu sori parce que america adna bi dafa wéccé ku legi waaw degala ñun bu ñoo joggé gambia fekk ay xalé lañ won suñu wajuri yakarna Sinyai bugun, you know why you know deaf decision ni dan buka dem you talk hall ni wow balanyo talk fini muna nyo dem dem uti darapa that's very difficult sometimes I mean when I've gone through that many of you that are listening have gone through that so neke sike gibi nga neka magna nga buka jena nem stay aksai hari mire nga ut plus for neka kumko yangi lige yangi buka um privacy is a space uh, it's difficult your parents your dad is usually most of the time okay with it your mom is not because no lelen yalla bine buguñ nga dem dañ fogne ben tay dal ega glo fi nga wara nekel sa bopa amna ay parents yo xamne ben tay sen domi amnañ kër yu mag ko xamne ñu ngi tabax sen kër deka fofu lolu yeb mbugel bi la rek yalla mo ko bine non neku ne dañ na xari deret so pour xale bu dem school dal bu dem college na nga make sure ne nga tok watan ak say ignore_time_segment_in_scoring ite bi nga am di bay hejna party bay dem restaurant tok rer ak say xarit bay yene ni nga xamne ni ñi sa xarit ñu ko jëfo di enjoy sen bop nga sacrifice ne da nga dem jangi di ñew di study guddi bu nek yaange study bo joge yaange pare dem école di ñew ciono bobu nonu rek kuko def bem jehal ñenen ti at college graduate kuko moy nit ko xamne dega 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 boko xolen ko wara respect parce que dafa am yu bari yu mbay pu dem jangi so it's a huge sacrifice so xale buy daw di dawal moto di dem jangi di ñew di dem jangi di ñew dafa bari ciono ciono traffic accident ci dafa am you know yalla musal len yalla ni yalla musal bay bu eggé ci campus bi dafa ut fu moy park bala mo park moto bi di dem legi legi nga yakam ti late nga park fena fo xam dañ la jot ticket wara dem fe ticket all of those problems bala mo la fa feka veke ne xale bi ofa nañ ko full scholarship na dem tok ci campus bi su fa neke mo lay xew security am na fa sa dom boko yare be nga xamne xamna lu mu wara def lu bax ak lu bon won nga am yakar ne mu na fa neka parce que am nañ ay adult ay adult kilifa yo xamne ñom ñoo le na top do school ci dañ am a lot of responsibilities sen lo wa deg la problem da fay happen ci university why school ci dañ am a lot of responsibility ngur gi daf le na punish na punish necessarily why they get huge fines to make a mistake because they responsible for top of dom sa dom magna 18 years and over why pentay kom kom ngi fofu non rek amna responsible bo xamne university ñu ko am xale yi nek ci campus ci sen dometrisi bu do fa dugal du fek am lo security card bo duggé di nga fekk net ku nek ci bunta bi fofu non 24 hours 
so deme dinañ la laaj fo ñu dem kan nga gisi sa dom bu dem college pour mu leer su fekene dafa apply pour dem college sa yi ko joxe kayit pour mu feel da nga make sone nga feel information bi mu signé amna kayit bi ñu oyé feup bo xamné daf ko signé né ki moy suma wajur sa yum oyé laaj suma mbir amna droit pour ñu jox ko parce que loi bi daf len jox droit né suñu égé 18 amna information bo xamné duñ la ko nango jox donté yaay wajuri xalé bi so nañ make sone information bobu nonu ñu ko topato euh ñu sign ko suñ ko signé signé nga signé sa yo kolé né da nga bëgg wax sa dom dinañ la ko mé nga wax ak mom sa yo kolé né da nga bëgg xam great summit dinañ la ko jox information bo soxla sa dom dinañ la ko jox way so sign it kayit bobu nonu mi da nga jox kenn autorisation pour mu sign al la ko on their behalf su fekké né jangulo nga xamné yéné luñ la wax xamulo ko na nga wut kenen ko xamné dina la dimbalé ko olu sen ni jaayi xale bi la bité on kulam man na defal nako ñu bari ñu ci gën euh ko xale yi man ma leen dimbalé ben jëm université so sen wajur daf ma jël ne ma waaw yow comme ko ya dégg anglais ya xam bir mi numuy démé yow sa sa tour na fa nek ba tay suma écrit téléphone hôte université bi laajté affaire yi some of my students amna access pour lay sen grade ci nakala mel euh fan lañ tollu sen student loan ci féké dañ am student loans financial aid ñu amé problème yépp dama ko mëna topato because mo tour mo ngi ci kayit bi xale bi dafa signé wajuri signé né mën nañ ma jox autorité hésum fofu bobu dafa important trop so bëggé xam da sa xale bi mu ngi perform di nga xam xale yi suñu jéna ci kër gi su fekké ñu nekk ci dom bi suñu jéna di dem fuentu fene ñu nekk fa bi guddi suñu ñew suñu swipe sen card bi university bi dina la mëna jox information né bi jéna na fi watu nangam watu nangam la delu ci so dolu mu fa su ko defé nga am watana sa dom deko sété su fekké dafa dem ci université bi way benen advantage buñu am moy né sa yum soxlén dimbal ci mbirim jangam rek nako am yow su fekké na sa xalé bi mu ngi sa kër gi fofu yow janga bi sori wulo hejna algebra ak math mënu loko nak nga ko mëna dimbalé su dafa struggle hejna mu ay haritam su bëggé access ci library bi mu ngi fofu dina dox dem ci library bi janga bi time bu ko né dom yi ñoo nek xalé yi dañoo am fofu noon ay room yo xamné dinañ fa study computers ya nga fa du jé free internet am nañ ko dinañ leka ndewo añ rer su soxlé su fa kanja mité lekal bo xamné ya ko toga ka toga ko yobul ko am nañ fridge xale yi nañ jënal len fridge bu ndaw 99 dollars so 65 box fridge bu ndaw bo xamné dinañ fa def sen leka waye da nga gis né advantage bu gëna am solo moy né tay sa dom bi mu ngi dem nek ci dometri bo xamné mu ngi dikkan nit ko xamné xamu ko xale bo xamné mo way des des way ni ko gaay di defé su fekké ni yow julit nga nga bëgg dikka ko julit dinañ la utal kuñ la matchal way lolu da nga tel topodo application bobu nonu suñu accepté sa dom su fekké dafa bëgg xale bu goor bo xamné nit ku ñu la ni mom bi te tuba ko xamné wori wut kuy tu cigarette ku du te cigarette yépp boko laajté dinañ la mëna are ñel nga am xale bo xamné di nga dikka ak mom xale bu bëgg clean ko xamné bëgg na di set waaw façon yoyu noonu yépp information bi université bi dinañ ko am su ko defé sa xel mëna dal né sa dom yi mu ngi dikka nit ku baax at least nit ko xamné hejna du ko mëna influence dinañ jang na ñoo cleané sen nek ñuy tlalé sen lali parce que ci kër gi yaay bi moy faral di def yéna yi papa bi diko dimbalé mitam mu am ay rakay jigen ñoo xamné légui légui ñoko defal yoyu bu démé ci université bi ci la xala bi di dor di nek mu kalaf bu baax bo xamné fi dafa xamné suma wajur nek fi so responsibility yoyu nonu dina fa nek way advantage bu bu ré fa nek waaw légui légui dañoo struggle xala yi dañoo homesick way lolu motax mané university dañoo faral di xol ci xale bo xamné jangana waye mu ngi involve ci community bi amna experience with people skills parce que bu xale bi démé am am homesick and all that stuff légui légui dafa affect grade sami so yoyu nonu moy problem bi lolu motax ñi bëgg xale di xam should be rounded students rounded means that they have exposure to quite a lot of things that they may have challenges why dañ mëna withstand those challenges without having to have an adult kulé na dimbalé so some kids are structured uh, so structure bobu ci elementary school bi uh, middle school ak uh, ak high school bi la ñëwé bala high school sax xale bi wara xam lolu so uh, a very high school ci moy uh, students ci suñu dem uh, uh, pour jël sen exams xale dañuy am sen midterm exams so we're going to be having tests uh, back to english exams are going to be admi- administered here we've talked about that um, so those are going to be coming up uh, maybe in the next few weeks look out for information that tells you your child is going to be taking a test 
um, I made those I made those emphasis last uh, week, indicating that kids go to school, um, and they're going to be tested, and those tests, trust me, are important. The universities will be looking at that data to see if your child is college ready. You don't have to wait till they get to high school to know whether they're college ready. It's third grade, fourth grade. That's where they start looking at that information, even for second grade sometimes. They can tell if a child is reading at such a level. Didn't I just say examples uh, last week about that kid, uh, I believe in, uh, was it Kansas? I, I can't remember, but there's this kid who actually performed so well that the university, Harvard, was actually offering him classes. Uh, so he's going to graduate uh, in high school uh, and, and become a... Uh, like have a degree but that's that's the information that becomes available for universities to be able to gauge if your child is college ready so these exams and tests are important make sure your kid gets a lot of sleep uh, stay away from using their gadgets as much as possible they can use them sometimes but limit it so they can get more sleep they can wake up fresh sour have breakfast go to school have lunch emphasize and insist on your kids eating before they take these exams, eat a healthy breakfast meal, and then they go and sit the exams. Encourage them, have that conversation with them. They get stressed out. I can't tell you and emphasize that enough. So these are important things that we need to pay attention to, okay? Um, so uh, to wrap all of this up, and it all comes down to reading, preparing your child. Uh, we're gonna play a story here uh, that is uh, a little bit of an interesting story, uh, but it also comes back to those of us uh, in the diaspora who came to the United States from a different country. Uh, the benefits that uh, that brings to all of us. Um, usually at the top of the hour, my system does act up, but alhamdulillah, it's been going well. So uh, let's see if we can continue on. Uh, but this uh, is a story about a family, uh, a parent who came to the United States several years back uh, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, shared his story about the love for reading. Uh, he, he loves just reading. And so uh, it's a story called NPR. And I thought maybe it'll jolt us as parents. And then I'll talk about, <clears throat> I'll talk about the reason why I think this is important, which as if we don't know reading and comprehension is just as critical. Uh, so here's a two and a half minute story about a family uh, that I thought maybe would help us wrap up this education uh, thing uh, about the importance of it. And then we'll talk about that and move on to science and technology. You're listening to Africa Focus on education here on the Father Network. I'm your host, Sol Baji. So let's go to the story that was posted uh, from NPR. They have story call every Friday, early hours of the morning. Uh, and I think perhaps they repeat it, perhaps they repeat it sometime during the day, but usually you have to catch it early hours of the morning. Uh, so Kelly Moffitt or Kelly Moffitt of NPR posted, posted this report. Uh, let's have a listen. This message comes from NPR sponsor Comcast. Comcast values your time. That's why you can schedule two-hour appointment windows, including nights and weekends. That way, you can spend more time doing what you love. Comcast, working to make things simple, easy, and awesome. Today's StoryCorps is a love letter to the written word. Alegaba Ramohan has amassed thousands of books. Ramohan immigrated from India to the United States in 1962. He came to StoryCorps in Chicago with his daughter. When I think of my earliest memories, I think of asking you homework assignments and you looking at my textbooks and falling in love with the textbook and reading it almost from cover to cover and only answering my question hours later. So where does that come from? When I was young, I'll give you an incident, mm -hmm. how I am hooked into this book business. When I'm nine or eight, uh, when my parents give me one rupee, which is like one dollar. You know what I do with that? Mm -hmm. I don't buy candy or anything. I just go to a stall where they sell children books. And I like all of them. So I ask what this one rupee can buy. So once I get eight books, then I come home. You know what I do? Even today I do this. I don't start reading the first page. 
I smell it. I know you do. I remember you, you that. You've seen it many I've times. I've seen you do that many, many times. The fresh book right. printed from the press, untouched. Right. I open, I, I smell right. it. Right. That's my connection with the book. The book became my friend. Better than my friends, you know, human friends. Uh, I feel that the author is talking to me mm-hmm. in person. Uh, now, if I go and ask him for wisdom, uh, he's a big guy. He may not talk to me. But now he's coming to me. Right. And he says, I'm here. I'm talking. Listen to me. The book could be written in any language. It can say anything. It's a transfer of knowledge from one person to the other. Uh, it doesn't force you to read. But it is there. That book, in my point of view, is very sacred. You have to read all books. Keeping an open mind. Open mind. Next time you'll think, well, wait a minute. There's another viewpoint there. If you want to give anybody something, the very best, give a book. It opened for me how to live. Alegapa Ramohan and his daughter Peru Venkat Plans are underway to build a library in his hometown where his 10,000 books will go when he dies. Their conversation is archived at the Library of Congress. That's a very, very uh, telling story about uh, Alegapar Ramohan, uh, who, like I said, is 79 years old. Um, Africa needs to invest on education. I'll emphasize these stories later on again as we share some of these knowledge. And for him, having to have the love, why am I saying that this is important basically is because our kids, the millennials these days, they just don't like reading. They would rather do uh, things that are uh, either audio uh, sometimes or electronic. They just don't like to pick up a book and read. Picking up a book and read, just like he said, is uh, also, the, uh, in my opinion, the best possible thing. Although those of us who uh, were the um, older generation really grew up reading. So, yes, I mean, somebody can argue that, well, you know, you grew up reading books because there was no electronic data at the time. And so you're tired. But people who write books basically write the books. They're available. The books are in the libraries. You have to go to areas where these books are to grab them and read. Uh, Just like you said, when you hold on to somebody that's written by somebody, they're sending and sharing the knowledge of an experience that you couldn't possibly be part of because you were not there. I mean, so somebody could argue, well, what do you mean? I mean, history, sometimes there are people who are there, but the person who wrote it is the person who wrote that information. And so he's sharing or she's sharing that information with you uh, at a different time from when it happened. And so that's the transfer of knowledge. If you can't comprehend, if you can't read, I'm telling you here, again, you can write it and take it to the bank. If you can't comprehend, if you can't read first, but comprehend information and be able to regurgitate material back out to somebody else who asks you the question, what have you read? you're not going to be able to get admission to college. You may not be able to find a good paying job because obviously you can't communicate with people. For us in Africa, for instance, I mean, we have this huge challenge of actually learning a language that was not something we were born and raised within. But does it mean that it's a daunting test? No, I mean, it's doable. People are doing that everywhere around the world. There are people who, uh, and I apologize, I think I got knocked off there by my system. Um, So um, that happens. But the story we were just talking about, just in case it it got out of, was the uh, Alagapa uh, Ramohan story, uh, which I was talking about reading. Uh, But the importance of of reading is it prepares you uh, for tomorrow, but it also allows you to read someone else's story two key important things that the people who know, people who uh, understand the implications uh, or the importance of reading and life as we know it. Abdul Saar uh, asked this question with Dr. Mbai the other day about the environment in which we are raised and how that tells whether uh, our 
a level of understanding, not intelligence. People are intelligent. I mean, it's just a matter of kind of, you know, the light bulb being turned on by somebody really working with that person constantly to give them that opening where they can begin to you know, germinate those skills that they have and be able to harvest those skills uh, tomorrow. But the environment in which you live, the food you eat, and unfortunately the people you interact with, that will dictate what kind of person you may end up being, besides your genes. Your genes are natural things that are given to you by God. And this is said by doctors and uh, philosophers and uh, the people in the religious sector. They know these things, they talk about it. So two things that happen to you in life is, you may have those genes that are hereditary from your family. Uh, and that's a gift. The environment in which you live is also critically important. That tells how successful you may or not. Some people may succeed in some of the most brutal environments, yes, but perhaps the genes were able to overcome all of those difficulties and sometimes see a lock. The books you read and the people you meet, these are key important factors in the life of a child. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about Nancy Pelosi, the, the new speaker of the house, um, about our experience. Everybody, we've all heard these stories from Barack Obama, a former president of the United States, and you know some of the great people they met, people who influenced their feelings and their thoughts and how they see the world. This, that's important, and the books they read. These are key competencies that are important for human beings. So reading uh, is important. You may not be able to meet Bill Gates, but Bill Gates has written books. So why don't you? grab a book that he's written and read it. Perhaps you may not be lucky to meet him in your lifetime. You may not be lucky to meet President Obama, but he's written books. Bill Clinton has written books. George Bush has written books. Um, the, the late um, um, uh, John, Senator John McCain has written books. These people have written books based on their experience. Grab a book that they've written. Uh, and Bob Woodward of the Washington Post has written books grab their books and read them or find a magazine or a newspaper and read it because someone is writing something that is important and it's knowledge that's being shared from them to you. Now if a kid doesn't like reading books at a minimum then they can read things that is electronic or maybe uh, we have uh, iPads I mean they're loaded with all kinds of information there's so many apps kids can learn in time in terms of their math skills and all the other skills that they need you know you have extra math there's so many programs available. You can use Khan, Acad Khan, Acad Khan Academy's uh, program. It's loaded, okay, um, with so much uh, uh, information, math, science, anything, you name it. Go to Khan Academy. You can watch audio, video, and, and do tests, electronic questions in math, and all kinds of skills. That's another equation that's there. It's available, um, math antics. Uh, these are all programs that are available for kids who struggle with math. They'll show you the simple ways of actually improving your math skills. And Math Antics is not expensive. It's a website that's available. I think it's probably, what, uh, $20 a year. You can, there's so many programs. Ask your school and, and enroll your child. Uh, if you buy an iPad, it's a one-time investment. Have that program or those programs loaded in them and, and give them a window of maybe two hours or one hour to kind of study. Um, but using the books to actually do math is very important. Kids gets to kind of do it hand uh, and transfer information from the book to his head, be able to do the calculus. Uh, you know, kids, they have all of these comprehensive skills that are not necessarily reading uh, related, but I mean, <coughs> being able to compartmentalize information, okay, and that they can uh, critical think, uh, you know, and be able to do math uh, in their head quickly. Uh, I, I, I forgot the word, the term to use, but if I remember, I'll, I'll say that. But kids can do math, they can calculate in their head quickly. But it's all about uh, practice, because that's that makes perfect. Um, practice all the time, how to do math skills. And But there are teachers in the school, there's so much help and support that provides that. And so it's important that we emphasize on the kids really learning and reading. So um, that's it. Um, so 
let's move on to science and technology and this one is going to be quick because today I'm going to be having Ibrahim come and join us uh, and talk to us about his experience back home uh, space exploration again uh, this is about education and then after we listen to this clip you know, we'll talk about that on the other side uh, this take a little bit but it's important here's a country who 40 years ago 40 years ago was probably under the radar um, except for uh, the United States and other advanced countries because they're looking at data they can tell that at some point in time this country is going to get to this level and I always emphasize that in 97, my 98, my first years in college, um, I've read a book, uh, I'll find the book, um, and uh, I think it was my political science uh, class where uh, this author who was Middle Eastern, um, I'll remember, it's been a while, it talked about uh, the United States really understanding at the time that China was going to be a world superpower. and and But Bill Clinton strategize how to make sure that we let China do what it's going to do to advance because there are great benefits but also try to win China's heart to invest or work with us partner with the United States and we're benefiting all of that today and many of us don't know this but it's as a result of some of the, the, the strategies and uh, the policies that were implemented some 24 years ago that we're reaping the benefits of today. Why do I say this? It's because of the fact that understanding that China's strength is probably not the United States' weakness. It, it actually complements the United States because now we have Apple manufacturing cell phones in China. That the United States perhaps had thought that we are not going to continue to be a manufacturing industry. We need to move to the next level, which is technology. This is what they're doing now. We can now sell technology to countries around the world because we invested in that. And so China is now mostly a manufacturing uh, uh, economy, but that's changing too because the United States, every country will have to change. You get to a level where other com companies have feeling that the manufacturing industry is becoming a little bit costlier, then they can go open shop in a country that is developing. China has actually gotten to that level. The reports have been there that the economy is slowing uh, because it's it's moving to a different level now, okay? But the partnership between the United States and, and China has benefited so many companies. Volkswagen, uh, you talk General Motors, Ford Motors, uh, uh, you're talking BMW, Mercedes. All of these companies benefiting today because there's a huge market in China and people wanted to buy these luxury cars. The lifestyle has improved. Uh, they've moved a lot of their families in population from poverty to the middle class and upper class. China has a lot of billionaires and millionaires as a result, again, of some of the policies that were put in place to say, no, we're not going to stop China from advancing, but we want to partner with China. And what is China doing in return? Imagine how much of China's money has been tied to our treasury bills. So we get to benefit from all of that. A lot of Chinese are coming to our universities to get education here. How much money are these private institutions having uh, because we've invested in having good schools, the Ivy League schools? How many Chinese are here doing business? So there's a partnership that's benefiting all of us. <coughs> and so, like I, like I said, 40 years ago, who would have thought? And here is the story that really should remind us all that yes, Africa can move itself from where it is to being a competitive uh, continent, but it has to start somewhere. We're doing things. I mean, there's a lot of movement in Africa, but I just think that the conversation about the classroom activities and how we teach our children is still not taking hold. And that's where the challenge is, as far as I'm concerned. Have a listen to this. The title is China wants to establish a base on the moon, space program experts says. 
This is from WBU. Uh, Jade Boston. Rabbit 2 started exploring the far side of the moon today, a first for humankind. The Chinese lunar rover landed on the dark side of the moon yesterday in a mission that could lay the groundwork for a human-occupied lunar base. Since its first manned spaceflight in 2003, China has emerged as a leader in a sequel to the Cold War-era space race. Let's talk about that with Namrata Goswami, an expert on China's space program. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you. So is this mission to the dark side of the moon a symbol that says to the world that the Chinese space program has arrived? It is, uh, for two reasons. One, because this is the first landing on the far side of the moon that has been accomplished by human beings. It's a very, very symbolically and technologically significant development, and it shows to the world that China's space program has arrived and can do original feats on its own. Long term, what does China want from the moon? So China views the moon as a base that it can utilize for research, for deep space exploration, to include asteroid mining and and looking at further into the solar system. And uh, in their white papers, they have articulated their vision for looking at moon not just by itself, but as a stepping stone to further their their, uh, goals for uh, becoming the only species on Earth to establish a human presence on the moon. Well, in fact, the Chinese have a plan uh, to create a manned lunar base on the moon, which is incredibly ambitious and, of course, would be a first. Yes, that's correct. Uh, in fact, if you look at what they have done on Earth uh, last year in Baihang University in Beijing, they have uh, generated a simulated lunar-like surface where they have had students live in that condition for about 365 days. Hmm. So yeah, so the long-term ambition is to see the, view the moon as an industrial base that's going to enable China further on to explore deep space, to include asteroid mining. So as you say, the moon is one thing. Uh, Another thing altogether for, frankly, the United States and China both is Mars. What can you tell us about China's plans for that planet? Uh, China has announced a program. So by 2035, building on their capacity for the moon, they're looking at sending a robotic probe to Mars. Uh, And also, very interestingly, two robotic probes to the poles of the moon. And so in terms of that program, I think what China is doing is very different from what NASA or the U.S. is focusing on. So as you know, today for the U.S. space community, including NASA, Mars is the significant concern. Mm. How do you go to Mars? How do you ensure humans going to Mars? How to develop the technology? For China, they're, they're having Mars, but that's the next term goal. The first is the moon. And I, and I think that's a much more smarter strategy, because if you develop capacity to be on the moon, that gives you a very cost-effective ability to then go and explore Mars, uh, which is also going to be much more cheaper. And I understand the Chinese also want to use that probe on Mars to collect soil samples and bring them back to Earth. How significant would that be? Uh, That'll be significant because very similar to the lunar surface where they are planning to bring back soil in their next probe so that they can see how much resources are there. Uh, Similarly, a sample from Mars would then enable humanity to understand what's the composition of that soil, what kind of elements it consists of, are they volatile, do they include any any trace of water. But you know, it's interesting that I need to point out that for China, Mars is not the focus right now, it's the moon. And I think I understand their strategy because the moon seems to be the place where there is enough titanium. For instance, the rover has landed on the oldest crater, Uh, of the South Pole. And so the important point is that this crater consists of three very important space resources. One is water. Two, there could be uh, huge amounts of iron. And then there is thorium, which can be used for generating uh, electricity from nuclear reactors. Mm. So I think their strategy is to look at Mars, but only in the next 20, 30 years. It's an incremental strategy to first establish capacity for a moon base. Okay, so all of this clearly has the United States concerned. Uh, President Trump uh, and others have characterized space exploration as a matter of national security. And here's the president announcing the creation of a space force in June. My administration is reclaiming America's heritage as the world's greatest spacefaring nation. The essence of the American character is to explore new horizons and to tame new frontiers. But our destiny beyond the Earth is not only a matter of national identity, 
but a matter of national security, so important for our military. How much is this competition from China driving this talk in the United States about a space force? I think it's one of the fundamental reasons, because if you look at the debate that preceded the Space Force creation, you had Alabama Representative Mike Rogers, you have uh, the representative from Tennessee, uh, Jim Cooper, who argued that uh, what China is doing in terms of ASAT technology, in terms of aligning its military to look at space as an area of focus since 2015, has resulted in American space assets being vulnerable. Hmm. And I say this with a measure of seriousness because if you look at the U.S. military, it's it's extremely dependent on space for GPS, for precision-guided missiles, for its nuclear submarines. So if China can hold those particular assets vulnerable based on the capacity it's building, that can create some kind of uh, fear in terms of the U.S. military's ability to engage in, in the Asia-Pacific and the role it has in the world. And so I think the establishment of a space force that is able to bring together different agencies of the government into a single uh, administrative unit is actually quite uh, uh, needed. It will, and China has its own plans for a, a GPS system uh, to create its own, uh, which could be of concern to the U.S. government, as you mentioned. But is militarization an explicit part of what the Chinese are doing in space? Uh, it is one of the components, for instance, if you look at the uh, you know speeches given by President Xi to the Strategic Support Force, which was established in 2015, for which space is a subunit of focus, his argument is that this particular uh, organization will develop uh, innovative military warfighting capacity to ensure that China has dominance in terms of access. Mm-hmm. And so I think I bring you back to the most important debate here, and that is access to space, especially not space just as a functional body body that gives support to Earth-based functions, but space as a geography. China is viewing space more as a geography, as a Mm. place where they can establish presence, especially for maintaining access and dominance. And so I think I I find this exciting, but I also have reasons for concern. If you look at uh, how China behaves when it establishes first presence, for instance, in the South China Sea or, for instance, in Tibet, I I fear that if China establishes presence, that will lead to access that it would then claim as an entitlement, as Mm. it has done uh, here on Earth. So I fear that if we do not have an international regulatory system in place, it could lead to uh, China claiming first presence rights. And there are people in the United States who would argue that NASA and the government have lost focus on space. The U.S. now relies on other countries to get astronauts to the International Space Station. I mean, you could make the argument that China is far more focused than the United States on this issue. Uh, Yes. And and to add to your point, uh, I agree with you that in the last 20 years, the U.S. has lost focus, especially under the first two Bush administrations and to an extent under Obama. And as you know, under President Xi Jinping, space is one of the topmost priority of the Communist Party of China, and they have committed resources for the next 20 years. Unlike in the U.S., where you have a change of regime every four years or every eight years, also you need congressional approval, which sometimes do not come forward. And so I think that's a clear advantage that China has in terms of space. Now, I think we do need to give the United States some credit for what they're doing. On the same week that China lands this spacecraft on the dark side of the moon, NASA has its own victory. Uh, The New Horizons spacecraft is sending back pictures of the most distant world that has ever been visited by a man-made object. Is your feeling that this competition between the U.S. and between China is good for everyone on Earth, that it pushes us all to strive just a little bit harder? I think the competition is good because, for one, that it encourages other nations to look at both countries' capability and capacity. So yeah, the competition is good in terms of the innovation that it's going to encourage. For instance, you know that the GPS system was also a part of that competition with the Soviet Union and came out of the military and DARPA. Mm -hmm. China's ambitions have been articulated very clearly, and that is to establish humanity's first base there for industrialization, for presence. And I think China has very successfully changed the discourse on space. Uh, by uh, articulating those ambitions very clearly. That's Namrata Goswami, an expert on China's growing space program. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure. Okay. um, Use rain tonight, uh, then gradual clearing with... Let me uh, stop this. I apologize there. Uh, I I don't think I need to go into the details of explaining uh, what just happened in terms of the report uh, about China and what... uh, uh, it's doing. 
Uh, but then again, you can see the worry from the, the, the West here because the concern has been uh, China is building up their military and all of that. But the GPS system is important. We use it today for uh, directions um, to get from point A to B. But it's important in terms of military, in terms of research, and all of these other equations that uh, Peter Overby uh, mentioned here uh, during the interview about China. Uh, again, this was a clip from WBUR, which uh, partners with NPR. Uh, WBUR in, is based in Boston. That's 90.9 .9, uh, station. But this is what 40 years has brought China. Uh, should Africa wait? Should Africa wait? I'm sorry, uh, that's my uh, system there. Uh, Siri uh, responding, I apologize. But 40 years of Chinese investment on education, on things that can change their life, now China is actually become a country to reckon with. But I, answer, I also mentioned the fact that back in the days, this was not a more of a combative issue uh, and we're reaping those benefits as a result. That's my take. Now, whether uh, uh, another administration is going to look at it differently, yes, you can You can argue that there should be concern. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that's how countries develop. So uh, maybe someday Africa would wake up and say, all right, we want to start exploring space because we think it's important, which it is. Uh, so we can be able to protect our environment, protect our, our air space and all of that stuff. Uh, and maybe do more research and find out what's happening in space. Uh, just like all of these components, the chemicals that are available on the moon. Uh, things that <clears throat> we weren't able to do. Not that people can't do it, but the investments, as you heard, were NASA to go to a different planet and, and get information. And we're all benefiting from that today. Um, so. Uh, that's important. <clears throat> Here's another story about science. And I apologize, my. Uh, let me uh, take a quick break here and get <clears throat> get my throat all cleaned up with some some more tea, and then we'll come back and then I'll read an article about uh, an astronaut uh, and some ex exciting experiment. Uh, you're listening to Africa Focus on Education here on the Fatu Network. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much. I apologize for that. Uh, it's cold, and so these are going to happen uh, every once in a while. So uh, here is a story, a uh, scientific story, before we go into uh, more on the social issues. Uh, again, this is from NPR, how to dial 911 from space. Uh, kind of interesting, but uh, so uh, you're used to dialing 911 or 9 to call out uh, when you're at work. Uh, so are astronauts, uh, but the pesky, that pesky extra digit tripped up touch astronaut Henry Kuipers Coop, uh, when he accidentally called 911 from the International Space Station. The astronaut was trying to dial an international number. He told Dutch public broadcaster Netherland uh, on rope uh, stitching uh, when he erred, uh, or erred. Uh, floating inside the space station, he made a mistake. Many people make in regular uh, gravity. He missed a number. Uh, first, you dial that nine for an outside line, and then zero one one for an international line. We all do that when we're calling. So, reading along, he explained, "I made a mistake, and the next day I received an email message. Did you call nine one one?" The sixty-year-old astronaut hung up promptly when he realized he error. Uh, his arrow, but uh, the call triggered an alert some 200 miles below at Mission Control in Houston. NASA security checked the room where the call was piped from or piped through. The astronaut, of course, was conspicuously absent. Uh, he said he slipped up in a conversation with the Dutch broadcaster about Neil Armstrong's 1969 moon landing. Uh, nothing that's actually quite easy to call Earth from the space station these days, or noting uh, that it's actually quite easy to call from Earth from the space station these days, uh, though there is often a time delay. Um, Wayne Hale, who served a flight director or as a flight director in NASA's mission control, 
tells NPR that astronauts in the International Space Station have been able to make calls as they please, are they, as they please for more than a decade now. The phone system uses voice over internet protocol. Uh, let me pause there for a little bit. Again, we, we're talking about science and technology. Uh, what they call VOP, uh, voice over internet, or VIP, or VOIP. I think that's the term, the acronym. These things just happened a few years ago. But again, like I said, when science and technology starts to advance, so many benefits come to it. The fact that the satellites were launched up in space gives us the ability to use our GPS systems, like I said, to go from point A to point B. And then science just takes its own, you know, course. It starts to kind of, you know, create so many opportunities. Uh, and build upon all of those things that benefit all of us. Today, you can move from uh, uh, Virginia to uh, Texas. If you have a number, you can use that local number down there. 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't possible. Uh, but you can use that number because you're going to use the voice over IP to make calls. If you have a program or system uh, or a cell phone company, or not a cell phone company, but uh, a phone company that provides you that avenue and there are companies I'm not going to name the name but uh, that do that so if you move from one place to another and you want to keep your number where you don't have to bother your family members uh, they can call you uh, on those numbers at any time obviously they'll be able to use that VOIP voice over IP to call and that can happen in our home country uh, in Gambia and in Africa for instance so this is the voice over IP that the astronauts were using. So back to the reading. Uh, it says the phone system uses voice over IP or voice over internet protocol, the same technology that lets earthbound people place internet calls over Skype. Uh, so that's another capability. So it's a capability that was built into the ISS with the rise of internet phone calls. It's the ability for the astronauts in the space station to just dial up anybody that they might want to talk to. Uh, many people have gotten calls from space. So, uh, Holly Readings, Chief uh, Flight Director at NASA, has received plenty of those calls. Uh, she says, quote, um, you're calling or you're carrying your phone uh, around and it'll ring. And it'll be the space station, she told Space Answers uh, in 2013. It's really actually kind of cool. It never gets old. Uh, so, Miss Dials from space are nothing new. British astronaut Tim Peake uh, once issued, uh, issued an apology on Twitter for a mistaken call. Uh, and here's his, tweak, uh, his uh, tweet from that. I'd like to apologize to the lady I just called by mistake saying, hello, is this planet Earth? Not a prank call, just the wrong number. And no, it doesn't work the other way. Uh, you can't accidentally call the space station. They can only call you. So it goes one way. Uh, it's only downward that it works, um, he said, or Hale said. Calls to the station are screened by mission control. True, although you might have more luck with a radio. Accidental 911 calls are old, uh, had too, and the ground <clears throat> at least. Brian Fontes, CEO of the National Emergency Number Association, tells NPR on international on in, in, intentional calls or intentional 911 calls have been an issue for decades. Fontes says even he has slipped up. He accidentally phoned 911 when he was trying to dial an international number, just like Kuipers. Uh, it happens, he says. We are all human. We we'll all make mistakes. Perhaps Kuipers' bigger mistake was hanging up. Fuentes says, uh, you should always stay on the line. If you make an accidental emergency call, uh, stay on the line. Or otherwise, 911 calls might assume there's an emergency and dispatch personnel, which is costly. That costs money. So Kuipers wouldn't have minded a visit, he jokes. Uh, I was a little disappointed that they had not come up. Uh, so he's talking about the emergency crew that they should have, you know, flown up to uh, space. But that's an interesting story uh, about science and technology. This was put in a uh, file by Francesca Paris uh, of NPR News, January the 4th, 2019. Uh, 
uh, it's called a strange news, but I mean, it's not strange, but I mean, it was an accident, but you're talking about space and uh, the knowledge that is out there uh, in terms of technology. Social issues. Uh, we're going to talk about women in politics uh, and what that means for young men or young women and men uh, of this generation. Uh, so we'll start with this short clip of uh, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Uh, she was on um, the Rachel Maddow show. And, and some of the stories I've been following her, uh, she shared a lot of her you know, background story. I do remember um, Elizabeth Warren uh, a few years back talking about the challenges that her family faced, her parents, and all the difficulties that they had to go through uh, at some point when she was young. Uh, dad was the only employee, and then at some point in time, paying the bills was difficult, and mom had to finally, you know, be in the homemaker, go find a job, and she explained the story about her mom really finding a dress and trying to put that dress on to go in for an interview, and she was there helping mom get dressed. And it was weird, but that, those are the things. So she. She has a passion for the middle middle income families and the poor people because she's lived through all of those difficulties. And she happened to share a little bit of that story uh, with Rachel Maddo a couple of days ago about, you know, the disparities between the extremely wealthy and the extremely poor and, and this, the squeeze of the middle class uh, going down instead of going up. Uh, and so I'm going to play a clip of that. So let me... Uh, roll back my uh, song here quickly while I uh, take the clip to where I want us to listen. Because this is a 44 minute one, but I want our men and women uh, to kind of learn a little bit about how these people, uh, you know, were brought up. Sometimes you look at somebody and you think maybe uh, this is how uh, they were raised. No, um, she was never raised uh, a wealthy uh, individual. Uh, some people in politics have been born and raised wealthy and lucky, but a lot of them are not. And so we'll share uh, that story in a little bit here. Let me play this clip um, and, and I'll come back and uh, play that clip where I want us to listen to the important things he's saying. Uh, stay tuned. We have to be in this fight. Be I highlighted when I brought you on before the break, I uh, highlighted the consistency of your message yep. and how you were an academic expert in that phenomenon before you were ever a political figure. You were a policy person in Washington on that issue before you were ever an elected official mm -hmm. campaigning on those issues. Long before. Long before. This has been your life's work to it try is. to undo this, the tilt of the system. And yet, when people go to the ballot box, both for the Democratic primary in 2020 and for the general election in 2020, there will be one very big thing different that was not true when you were doing all that previous work, which is Donald Trump. Yes. And is Donald Trump a qualitatively different thing that either changes your analysis or that has made you feel more urgent about these issues that you've worked on? Is he just a continuation of what all the other Republicans have been Donald like? Trump is an accelerant. Okay. He takes a problem that has been growing and growing and growing and he just sets it off and makes it worse than ever. Because of corruption? Because, yes. Okay. Because of corruption. I mean, just look at it that way. That's what this is about. He takes this government, and he's pretty damned open about it, and says, this government works for the rich. What, what was the first order of business? What did it take? So first they tried to take away health care from tens of millions of Americans, came within one vote of doing that. In fact, when it passed the House, what did they all do? They all went off and celebrated, high-fived over any, taking away health care. Any Republican president would have done Hold that. Hold them right? together, and yeah. then what was the next thing to do? And the big one that they held every single Republican together for, so it's Republicans, was give a tax break to the rich, give a trillion and a half dollar giveaway to billionaires and giant corporations. And notice what Republicans have said. Well, as long as he can keep delivering on those tax breaks, mm -hmm. yeah, he kind of says some things that make us all a little uncomfortable, and he's a little louder and don't like the tweet thing, and the whole foreign policy seems to be a disaster, but hey, the rich folks got a trillion and a half dollars. And who's supposed to pay for that? Uh, people who get Social Security, our students who have to pay the interest rate on student loans and can't refinance those loans. Every part of this is angled over and over to pay off the big donors, make sure they get their part, 
and leave everybody else behind. When I look That's at the, what this is about. When I look at those things, mm -hmm. though, those specific things you just mentioned, repealing health care, the tax cuts, and I would also include in there the choice of Neil Gorsuch and oh, yeah. Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Those are all things I can imagine yep. a President Romney doing, mm -hmm. or a President Paul oh. Ryan, or a President Mitch McConnell, or in, a President... In fact, I think, didn't, didn't uh, soon-to-be Senator Romney just say that in an op-ed today? He said, you know, don't like how he behaves, but look at all those great things he's done. It's exactly. right up there in the first paragraph. And so, love those taxes, love those judges. But for a lot of Americans, both, con I think, conservative Americans and liberal Americans, and people who don't like to align themselves with politics at all but are worried right now, Donald Trump is not just the next Republican president. He is a special kind of crisis. He's a special kind of departure from even what had been Republican politics in the past. Do you see that, or do you see him as just the next Republican? So I see him as what happens when corruption invades a system, hmm. that it gets a little bit corrupt, and it gets a little more corrupt, and it gets a little more corrupt, and then it gets bigger, and they get bolder and bolder. And then you end up with someone like Donald Trump, somebody who just isn't even coy about it. Okay. Someone whose cabinet appointees don't know sick them from come here about whatever is the subject area they're supposed to be in charge of. Cabinet officials that get caught for just it, for trading in stocks in the in the areas that they are supposed to oversee. Cabinet officials that don't even pay their taxes. And no shame. Just keep it up. Because now they're wallowing in the corruption. But the problem is a long systemic problem. You know, you describe this as my life's work. Mm -hmm. But it truly is my whole life's work. I, I, I'm a kid who had a dream when I was a little tiny girl, I wanted to be a public school teacher. All three of my older brothers went off, they joined the military. I just wanted to teach school, but that meant I needed a college diploma. And by the time I graduated from school, no chance for something like that. My folks didn't have the money for that. And so I ended up, it's a bumpy path. I drop out of school at 19, I got married. I found a commuter college, $50 a semester. And I got a four-year diploma that I could go become a public school teacher on a price that I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job. That's how you build a middle class. That catapulted me into the middle class. I am the daughter of a man who ended up as a janitor. And I got a chance to be a public school teacher, a college professor, and ultimately a senator. Because America made an investment in a kid like me. My life's work is for every kid to have an opportunity, every kid. Right now, those opportunities are shrinking, and they're shrinking even harder for people of color, people who have, have just always caught the wrong end of the stick in this country. And this is a democracy. There's more of us than there is of them. We get organized, we put it together, we can make real change. And for me, that's what this is all about. People told me we couldn't build a consumer agency. We got organized and we made it happen. People told me I couldn't beat a popular Republican incumbent, but we got organized and we made it happen. Shoot, people told me you couldn't get any accountability after Wells Fargo ended up uh, uh, cheating millions of their own customers. But I said in an open hearing that I thought the CEO of Wells Fargo ought to lose his job. And a few weeks later, that's exactly what happened. You get into these fights, and that's how you win them. Senator Elizabeth Warren is our guest. Stay right there. We'll be right back with her. She has just announced the exploratory committee for her presidential bid. Stay with us. Okay. Um, that was a story that I wanted to share with a young men and women. Uh, I mean, young men and women, men and women, women especially, to understand that a lot of these politicians who represent us, the ones that understand the pain and suffering that the middle class goes through, not that wealthy people don't. Bill Gates is investing $40 billion of his money in countries outside of the United States. Uh, people ask the question, why isn't he investing it here? He has, but uh, there's a reason for all of this. So there are wealthy people, Warren Buffett, all of these people are concerned. You can talk about the Koch brothers all you want, but they've actually been gravitating towards understanding that 
This is not zero sum. Uh, so they understand the importance of education, of helping the poor people, poor families, building communities. If communities crumble, no one is going to buy their products. And their business people, they understand that. But more importantly, a lot of them have extended family members who aren't wealthy. And so they can understand looking at data that, you know, there's something happening in the country. And we need to do something. And, uh, you know, I, I don't support the Koch brothers because of some of the things that, but they're doing some great things. Um, some of the things like the, uh, the new law that's passed to make sure that the incarceration rates are kind of reduced, which is the justice um, system that was passed by the Senate and a whole lot of things that they're doing out there that are, you know, having an impact on uh, the average American. Well, my point is the people who've lived through these difficulties tend to understand that, yes, I can look at someone and tell because I can relate with them. I have been through all of that. The message to our young men and women, and our women especially, is that, yes, and you'll get to understand that message when I play the next clip of the new speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you got to be able to fine tune and stay focused on the things that you care about, but you need to understand those things. Um, but you know what? Public service is a word course, and, 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 and it's a beautiful thing for people to uh, spend time in. Uh, when you serve your community, you get this feeling of an accomplishment. Not that working for private companies is not a good idea. It is. I mean, you manufacture and make things that people buy. You create things. Um, but the importance of public service is you don't get paid enough for all of the things that you have to go through. But she has talked about all the things she has accomplished. And it's all the strength. She gets attacked all the time. But the beauty is she, she knows exactly why she's doing what she's doing. And, and the next clip would actually put the icing on the cake about why. I believe that, I mean, women are just as important. And then the message for young people, you, you know, do what you think is best for you and don't look back. And none other would be uh, a, a, an added equation, value, to what uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren said than the Speaker, who for the first time in the history of the United States has been Speaker of the House, the first female Speaker, and is becoming another one or has become another Speaker uh, of the House um, in the United States again. Uh, again, let's have a listen to Nancy Pelosi on our interview yesterday, MSNBC with Joy Reid. I hope there's no commercial, but let's see if there's one. All right, so here we come. Yes, I knew there was going to be a commercial. Um, anyway, uh, let's see if we can um, bypass that quickly. All right, uh, so while the commercial runs its course, uh, which that's how companies pay for all of these bills, I guess. So, um, but Here's the clip. Let me see if I can get that. All right, welcome back to Trinity Washington University. Madam Speaker, I want to take a little bit of a break for a moment before we get back to the hard new stuff. I want to show you a picture. <laughs> That's a young lady. And this is when President Kennedy was running for president. I was like 16 in that picture. My father was mayor of Baltimore. Of course. And President, Senator Kennedy, candidate for president, came there to speak at a United Nations dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother uh, would normally be accompanying my father, and she knew I wanted to meet President Senator Kennedy. So right. she enabled me to go. So I sat next to him at dinner in the first lady's seat. And it was a funny thing. <laughs> It's funny, sir, because I was a, a member of what we called United Nations High School sure. opening at the time, and so the high school kids had a table there, and they came up to me and said, we'd like to invite you to come sit with us instead. <laughs> and I said, oh, I could never leave this seat. <laughs> A little bit about Nancy <laughs> D'Alessandro. Um, you grew up in Baltimore. A lot of people don't. Maybe not, maybe some people know it. Um, but you were a Baltimore girl. Obviously, your dad mm -hmm. and your brother were mayors mm -hmm. of Baltimore. Um, you're so much associated with San Francisco. What parts of you are Baltimore? What parts of you are San Francisco? <laughs> well, first of all, I got. A, we grew up in a family that was devoutly Catholic. Mm -hmm. Very proud of our Italian American heritage. Um, fiercely patriotic about America, 
and in our case, staunchly democratic. Mm -hmm. So all of those virtues, my view virtues, <laughs> would be very transferable to San Francisco, sure. where our anthem is the song of St. Francis, make me a channel of thy peace, mm -hmm. where there's darkness, light, and the rest. Uh, but the, what I always say is that the pride that we took in our own heritage enabled me when I went to San Francisco to respect the pride of such an incredibly diverse pop. Everybody is there, yeah. and every division within every category of people yeah. is there. So uh, it's the, uh, I think our own ethnic pride is a, a, a source of respect for other people. Yeah. And we always, my mother was very uh, civil rights oriented, my brother uh, as well, my father mm -hmm. too, but the two of them even more so. Yeah. And uh, so it, what it was is about respect, that public service is a noble calling, mm -hmm. uh, that as I said in my remarks yesterday, uh, that we should serve with our hearts full of love mm -hmm. and that America is a country whose heart is yeah. full of love. And when people ask, where is hope? Yeah. You say it's sitting where it always has been, between faith yeah. In the goodness, the mm -hmm. love of others, that yeah. something will happen. Let me try to get in one soon. I'm going to try to sneak you in here. Uh, Ewalua Ogudana, political science major from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Quickly, what's your question? Speaker Pelosi, what kind of challenges do you face holding one of the highest elected positions as a woman, and how do you handle them? Well, <laughs> thank you for your question. Um, Feel free to include dealing with the mansplaining and dealing with people <laughs> interrupting you. I just interrupted you, but men interrupting you when you're trying to do your job. <laughs> well, let me just say this. You can't let that stand in your way. I just say to young women especially, or women newly emerging into the public sector from, as I went from the kitchen to the Congress, from housewife to house speaker, whatever the path is, whether it's right out of college or whatever, uh, Know your power. Just know your why. Why are you interested in public service or whatever it is, the academic world, military, corporate America, whatever it is. Know your why. Know your subject. Know why you're doing it. Know what it is. Know about it so that you can speak with authority on it. Have a plan. Be strategic. And uh, communicate. You, if you show your vision, your knowledge, your plan, you will be able to attract that connection is so important. Mm -hmm. And so have your own confidence. Don't worry about their hang-ups. Just don't okay. worry about their hang-ups. Okay, now, we've got some heavy topics to get to in this town hall, but I want to do a quick lightning round with you, if you don't mind, before we go to break. Okay, this is a very quick lightning round, so you got to give me short answer, very quick answer. Okay, you got 20 minutes at the end of the day. What do you do? 20 minutes to yourself. I, uh, uh, well, it's a little bit personal. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's just us in the room. <laughs> well, my, my relaxation at the end of the day to soak in the tub, eat chocolate candy, and do the crossword puzzle. Okay, okay. All right. In the alternate universe where you're not in politics, you're not Speaker of the House, what would your dream job be? Grandmother. That is my dream job. <laughs> okay. Now I think I can guess what the answer to this next one is. What's the one thing you can't live without? Oh, well, my family, of course, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, excellent answer. Okay, we are going to come back. I used to say to my husband when we were dating, um, uh, I don't think you, I don't know if I could give up chocolate for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but anybody who loved me would never ask me to give up chocolate. Fair. <laughs> I think that makes absolutely perfect sense. More with Speaker Pelosi after <laughs> uh, Okay, I, I think my... Uh, System went out there for a minute. Let me see if I can get it back. Um, <clears throat> okay, I apologize. We went off the air there for a minute, uh, but that was just the tail end of uh, Nancy Pelosi's interview, and as he's made some points, uh, Iwaloa, the girl who was asking the last question, uh, I am so has some African heritage uh, based on the name that I just saw. But then again, it's uh, a combination of diverse women sitting there asking questions to the new Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Okay, moving along to uh, uh, social issues. What are businesses doing today to attract talent? What type of perks are these corporations offering uh, in this very tight labor market? Again, so we've talked about education, uh, we've talked about all the beautiful things and, and you know, families and uh, the importance of society and 
uh, uh, all of that, uh, how you prepare your child to go to college. So uh, let's see if we can uh, make some sense out of this very, very important topic. If anything, if you have children and, and they're going to school or perhaps getting ready to go to college, uh, don't miss this story here. I'm going to read it. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Again, these are trends now. I mentioned that I filter information that's beneficial that we can all uh, kind of take home and, and utilize to our own advantage. This is a Wall Street Journal article. It says, the title is, Now Hiring with Attractive New Perk, Free College Degrees. So companies say benefits of a happy, better educated staff outweigh the cost of paying for workers college education. Um, let me pause here for a minute. I mean, I I remember, yes, okay, the company I worked for back in the days kind of paid for my education. But what happened was I had to register and go for at least a semester or two on my own uh, before I got hired into the company, uh, at least one semester. Uh, and then I submitted my uh, tuition reimbursement form. Those of us that are a little bit older know how the system works. And then the company has a reimbursement, tuition reimbursement program, luckily. Not all companies offer that. Uh, and then they'll say, well, if you maintain a B or better grade and you turn in your grades, and then we'll reimburse you. So you have to take a loan, take a student loan or whatever financial aid you get and pay for your classes. And in return, uh, when you turn in your grades, then you get reimbursed. The benefit for that is the company is investing in you uh, after the fact, so, so to speak. You go to school, they, they re reimburse you, but you have the power to leave them. Well, the hope is once they pay for your school, you can stay with them. Uh, you can leave and go to another company. They, don't, they can't stop you. So that's a perk, that's a benefit. Here it is, the company is teaching you how to, be, to do to better perform those skills that you're hired to do. They're paying you a salary, you have other benefits, but hey, you go to college and then you get a degree, uh, we'll pay for it. The hope is that as you graduate and you get a degree, then you have opportunities available that you can apply for and the company can now begin to use your expert knowledge from learning new skills from a, a school or college setting. That's very important. So now you come in and you apply those skills in your work. The company benefits from that. They make money. Okay. Um, the difference here is now companies are beginning to realize that they, they can do it differently. So the whole story written by Kelsey G of the Wall Street Journal was posted on January 2nd. And here's the story. Some of America's largest companies are proposing that a good job can lead to a free college education reversing the norm that requires workers to get the degree before launching a career. Back then, like I said, the auto industry was changing uh, a lot of the ways they were doing business. There was a certain time back in uh, the early 2000s, at the turn of this century, that uh, companies are beginning to say, all right, you have to have, because they have tuition reimbursement available. So the emphasis is, uh, the memo went out. For you to be considered for promotion, you have to have a bachelor's degree or better or something like that. Um, so you apply for a position, they're looking for that criteria. Why? Because the company has the perks available for you to go pursue your education. They want to be able to, com to compete with other companies. So that perk was available. This white here is a little different. And I mentioned last week, who is going to college these days? So this is, these are one of those stories. It's a profound story that I think the companies have taken ownership now, knowing that there are pitfalls there. They may educate somebody and get them a master's degree or bachelor's degree, and a person could walk away and go work for another company because of the tight market that we have available. But there are benefits for it. People are human. If you work for a company that's paying for you to go to college full tuition, and then chances are sometimes you tend to believe that, you know what, I owe it to this company. And these companies are not, they're not stupid. The millennials and the Generation Xers don't care these days. They've learned their lessons from 2009. They've looked at their parents' history uh, in terms of working for one company and staying there for years and years and years. And these companies continue to make profits, but their families or their parents are not making a lot of money. 
they feel because they get a degree, they can compete. They'll look for jobs, whatever opportunity there is. So yes, companies are aware of that. Uh, and how do they mitigate that? Sometimes these kinds of perks. Uh, but uh, let's read the story and continue on here. Walt Disney Company, Discover Financial Services, Young Brands Inc., Taco Bell are among the high-profile employers sending frontline workers back to school, often paying the cost of tuition, fees, books, and other expenses up front and in full. The companies say the benefits of a content and potentially better trained staff outweigh the cost. Many lag employers have long offered limited tuition assistance perks to staff, reimbursing up to the federal tax exempt minimum or maximum, which is $5,250 a year. After the student successfully completes coursework, like I indicated before. For most people though, paying out of pocket and then waiting for the company benefit to kick in later proved too much of a barrier, um, said John Kaplan, Discover's Vice President of Training and Development. Let me go up here. Okay. Even so, Mr. Kaplan said, with around 80% of Discover's 7,000 call center and field staff lacking a college degree, the company saw a good return on every dollar invested in tuition. As participating employees stayed with the firm longer and moved into more senior positions at a higher rate. I think I mentioned this. So Discover unveiled a new program in May that foots the bill for employees to attain the University of Florida, Brandman University and Wilmington uh, University and pursue one of seven online degrees in business, cybersecurity, computer engineering or organizational management, all fields where the company has urgent hiring needs. By December, more than 700 Discover workers signed up, more than double the annual number of people taking advantage of the credit card issuer's traditional tuition reimbursement program, Mr. Kaplan said. Obviously, I'd like to keep as many employees as possible here, but if this program helps someone graduate, some employees graduate college and go on to have a brighter future, career elsewhere, God bless them, Mr. Kaplan said. That's an awesome downside to have. There are 12,800 employees from Discover, Walmart, Inc., and other companies pursuing degrees on the corporate dime at Brandman University, which offers a mix of bachelor's and graduate degree programs uh, and on, 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 on 25 campuses across California and Washington, D.C., uh, according to Brandman Chancellor and Chief Executive Gary Bram. Or Bram. To secure new corporate partners, uh, Brandman pays an undisclosed fee to Guild Education, a, a, a Denver startup that brokers deals between companies and colleges. Employers choose which majors and schools they, want, they will finance and receive discounted tuition by enrolling more of their workers. Such arrangements offer colleges a potentially massive pipeline of adult students at the time, at a time when many face shrinking pools of traditional candidates, said Rachel Carlson, uh, Jill CEO and co-founder. The cost of a bachelor's degree from a four-year U.S. institution averages $33,000, according to the Education Department. Jill said by providing schools a large number of part-time and full-time students, it can negotiate the total price down to between six and $10,000 in some cases including technical support and academic advisors designated for company employees. Some companies, including Walmart, pay 100% of those costs directly to the school, according to Gill, with minimal or no expenses for workers. So Walmart, Walmart asks participants to contribute $1 a day for each college program, which enrolled 1,000 store employees in three partner universities this fall alone, a spokesman said or spokeswoman. Uh, other companies, including Taco Bell, cover up to $5,000 or so a year in cost upfront and negotiate deals with textbooks and other student services for employees. A Taco Bell spokeswoman said the company now offers the college benefit to all 210,000 employees, 210,000 employees, after a pilot version last year boosted retention among participants by one third to 98%. Working adults are going back to class 
for programs ranging from two-year associates to masters of business administration degrees. Their ranks range from line cooks and theme park workers to mid-career managers for whom the price tag put the degree out of reach, companies and university officials said. In the tightest labor market in decades, Disney Discover and other companies say covering the full cost of college can help them hold on to valuable talent that has become more expensive to attract. Now we want to create upward mobility for our employees and more than anything else, for people to be able to look ahead and, and see greater opportunity than they had before, said Bob Eager, chief executive of Disney, which launched its back to school benefit for its 85,000 employees in August. More than 1,000 employees enrolled in a matter of months. Disney said it would spend $50 million on its employees' educations by mid-2019 and $25 million a year after that. Even if those workers end up quitting their jobs at Disney, covering college costs immediately pays off in a more engaged and confident staff, Mr. Eager said. This program has the ability to increase the pride people have in what they do here and what they're, they're capable of doing, he said. It makes people feel good about themselves. Tour guide Jamie uh, Pacheco, 59, who works at Disneyland in Anaheim, California, is pursuing a bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Denver. It has been nearly 30 years since she dropped out of college as a working mother. She said, but with Disney footing the bill, completely her degree is finally within reach. It could be at least two more years of online courses, work, coursework before she'll earn enough credits to graduate. Ms. Pacheco estimated, adding that she earned straight A's for her first quarter this fall. It's been a life-changing experience for me, she said. This is something I never thought I would achieve. Finishing a degree I set out to receive so many years ago. It's a beautiful story if you have children who are going to college, uh, maybe graduating, uh, then look at these companies and try to see if you can apply and be hired. Uh, if you can't afford to pay for your child's college, here's an opportunity from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, follow that um, article and read it. It was posted on January uh, the 2nd, but it's still available. Today is January the 5th. Um, so very important, uh, something we can learn from. Uh, Okay, I got another one that I'd like to share with you. Um, let's see here. Um, this one is from Here and Now, uh, from WBUR in collaboration with NPR. Uh, the story about what the companies are doing today in attracting, again, another untapped um, uh, uh, demographic of people. So listen to this story and I will talk about that. This story has importance for many of our families who have autistic kids. I mean, that is an understatement to begin with. Special needs um, students, we've talked about this. A lot of these kids who are autistic are some of the brightest students you would ever come across in your life. The fact that someone has disabilities in certain areas doesn't mean they're not smart. God is so great. He gives these people so much talent. And for us in Africa, we just never find out. We just don't tap into it. People die because of stress. The people isolate them. We want to talk to them. We don't want to, we're blaming the mom. We're blaming somebody else for all of the problems that they're going through, which obviously is something created by God. It's a test to see maybe, can we find out what these person's strengths are and utilize them? Like we've talked about last week, we spent some time talking about the special needs, or tough construction, invited and gave them a lot of money. Cambia and Africa can utilize these people who have special needs. These are challenges just like us. I mean, you may be uh, physically capable of doing so many things, but you may have your weaknesses. They sometimes are visible, but these are smart people. We talked about these women who were so articulate talking to Fatu, but they are isolated, they, they demoralize. So people die because of that depression and stress. Here's a story from Microsoft that was on WBUR. Uh, Robin Young and Jeremy uh, were sharing this story a few days ago uh, about companies now beginning to tap into something that no one has ever uh, in the past years has tapped into. We're gonna listen to the story. It's a beautiful story. 
Have a listen. A job search can be fraught, what to wear, what to say. But for candidates with neurological differences, autism, social anxiety disorders, it's often impossible. That's why recent reporting in the Boston Globe got our attention about companies adding neurodiversity to their recruitment, actively seeking people who might not get through traditional job interviews because maybe they don't make eye contact or are nervous in unfamiliar settings. And these companies say this isn't charity. It's about getting the best employees. Neil Barnett heads up Microsoft's Autism Hiring Program, and he joins us from Seattle. Neil, that's a thing, autism hiring? It is. It's one of my favorite topics. There's just a huge under and unemployment rate when it comes to autism, close to 80%. Uh And there's just a lot of talent out there, and and more and more companies are seeing that. Okay, so you have a title, and there are people who are doing this within Microsoft. It is a thing. We'll find out more about that. Uh, But also joining us is 28-year-old Oliver Wilcox. He has a master's in applied math from Loyola University in Chicago. He also has ADHD, social anxiety, a speech and language disorder. But now he's a software tester at a tech startup, Iterators, which hires only neurodiverse candidates. We'll learn more about that company. But Oliver, I want to congratulate you because you're on something called a reported app. You're recording yourself on your smartphone, and apparently you set it up in a second, and we have people who can never set it up. So mm-hmm. th- this is a, these are skills you have, but just tell us, what was it like when you first tried to go on job interviews? I applied for over 100 jobs in Boston. I applied to pharma companies, universities, hospitals, financial institutions, and more. And for all the jobs, I had the skills and passed the assignments and was excited about the company. And I learned that people underestimated me because I talked a little differently, even though I had the skills for the job. They often assumed I was too nervous in the interviews because I tend to fidget and take some extra time to share my thoughts. Hmm. Well, for instance, are you nervous right now? Um, just a bit. Just a tiny bit. Uh, so, you know, maybe you had just a little bit of nervousness that most people have in job interviews or radio interviews, but there were other mannerisms that you say, you know, people misunderstood. How frustrating was that for you to know that, you know, you had the skills and we're not getting the jobs? It was very frustrating. I was told that I was not a culture fit or appeared very nervous. They turned me down not because of my skills, but because of things I can't change about myself. Let's uh, go back to Neil for a second. Uh, Is that something you hear, that there's um, an impression that comes across in job interviews, and it's almost impossible for people like Oliver to overcome that? I would say the interview process for anyone is a is a challenging experience, but definitely we've seen candidates that are on the autism spectrum express the same things that Oliver had stated Um, whether it's making eye contact or just the initial interaction. One of the reasons we created this program at Microsoft is to really think about how we could be more inclusive and have an interview process that candidates could come be themselves and really showcase their skills to get employment. Instead of just basing it on the interview. So what do you do? If you think about going through that traditional front door at a company, our front door is a little bit different. For candidates in this program, it's a five-day program. And we really bring the candidates in and let them get comfortable, get to know one another, get to know the hiring teams. We do team exercises, kind of like the uh, marshmallow challenge, it's where you use toothpicks and marshmallows to build a bridge <laughs> to kind of look at, you know, teamwork. We spend time doing practice interviews. And then like anything else, we do typical interviews like we do at Microsoft. But instead of doing it in one day back to back, we spread it out over two days. So what are people on your staff? And again, you're heading up the autism hiring program at Microsoft. It's just amazing. What are they looking for? Well, I mean, we're looking for the same things that we look in all employees. We're looking for talent. We're looking for people that work with one another. We're looking for people that can really make an impact with the products and services that we're producing. And so the whole goal of the program is just letting candidates have a a better way to showcase and shine their skills than just that typical, you know, one-day intense interview that many companies do. Do you throw the net wider than people on the autism spectrum? Because there are people with obsessive-compulsive disorders, you know, social interaction issues. Mm -hmm. Oliver spoke of those. Do you throw it wider? Uh, We do broad, inclusive hiring for people with disabilities at Microsoft, and so that's everything that you just stated. Mm -hmm. This program in particular is focused on autism, but we're always hiring people with all disabilities at the company. Oliver, talk more about the the work 
that you're doing now. This is the company Iterators. It was actually started by your mom, we understand, when she saw this, the frustration that uh, young people with some neurological difference were having. What kind of work do you do there? Okay, so I'm a software tester. I find errors and, and bugs in websites and mobile apps so companies can fix them and have their products run smoothly. My favorite job so far has been with a company called Hydro, which is working on a new growing machine. I test their software while growing because that's when the errors occur. Well, okay, so you test for bugs and errors, and the one that you like the best, you have to row, did you say? Like you're rowing yeah, on a that, rowing machine? Yes, but they're not that hard. It's not that hard. What kinds of mistakes have you spotted? Sometimes the statistics are wrong on the exercise machine or the or the workout ends too early or something like that. I'm sure you've mm-hmm. heard, Oliver, that some very often people who have what other people would call neurological issues are actually neurological gifts, and that there are people like yourself who see patterns and spot things that others can't. Is this something that you, you're finding? Yes, and yeah, I've been able to see patterns that other people can't for a long time. Yeah. And Neil, terrific that you have this autism hiring program. But as I said, I, I, I'm betting it's not, you know, to be kind, al- although that would be a side effect. We're looking at it as a business and the business impact. And again, it's finding talent. And so the spectrum is wide and diverse. And so everyone brings something unique to the table. And we have people that we've hired that are writing code that's being used by millions of people or they're contributing to the next version of Windows or Office. And so, again, it's for us, it's been a talent play. In fact, the people that you are hiring, they have the education, right? Talk about what some yeah. of their professional jobs or degrees are. So this goes back to the under an unemployment rate, which is really high, around 80%. You know, we have individuals with four-year degrees, masters, PhDs that are working at retail or packing boxes, and they're not utilizing their skills. And, you know, this is why a program that can be more inclusive and help you screen in individuals to find the talent is something that both Microsoft and other companies are finding really valuable. Yeah. Well, uh, many other companies, uh, Microsoft, SAP, Ford, Bose, uh, have all seen the benefit in this. Oliver, how does that feel to you to hear the extent to which people are looking for people like you? Well, it's good to hear that some people are realizing that people who are neurodiverse can have some things that they can offer the companies that other people can't, and that would make it easier to get jobs for other people who are neurodiverse. In fact, people are calling this not a disability, but a cool ability. But what would you say, Oliver, to someone who says, help me work alongside you? That's just some things that I do, like I'm sometimes fidget with things, but it's not because I'm nervous, it's because I just do it sometimes. And sometimes I just look around in different areas to see but my surroundings, so that's not, also not because I'm nervous. And Neil, you're doing these job searches for people on the autism spectrum four times a year. What would you say to the employer who's not sure how to start? I talk a lot to other companies that are thinking about starting programs, and I always talk about the business impact that they will see. And so this is not charity. This is business impact whether it's the benefit to the culture, to the products, the services that they produce. And so when you frame it up in that frame, companies are a lot more open and really trying to understand what it would take to do something similar that fits their own culture. Well, and maybe be in touch with other companies that are doing this. Yeah. So we've actually, at Microsoft, we've started a coalition. It's called Autism at Work Employer Roundtable. Um, There's about 15 companies in there today. And our goals are to help other companies start programs. We also have created a job board on the website. And then we're all trying to obviously share best practices amongst ourselves. So there's a lot of momentum in this space, and we're really looking for more companies to join the coalition. And when you talk about how it's good for business, uh, you know, what impresses you most about your employees' skill sets? About 50% of the people who have come through our program had applied to Microsoft before through that traditional process. And, you know, sometimes their resumes weren't picked up or sometimes the phone screen was was tough and they didn't get past the phone screen. But when we brought them in this more inclusive way through that other front door, that different lens of way of thinking, they got in front of hiring managers and hiring managers would say, wow, 
I want you not just on my team at Xbox, but I want you to have a career at Microsoft. And we're hiring people all across the company. Oliver, you have a job at the company where you're looking for bugs in software. But what would you say to a, a future employer? Uh, you know, why, why should they hire you? So I think that companies should look at the people that they are interviewing and think about if they can do the job versus looking at their experience while thinking about their social skills or perceived comfort in the interview. And if they did that, they would have better employees because people who are neurodiverse can do some tasks better than traditional employees because of the way they see the world. That's Oliver Wilcox. He has a master's in applied mathematics. Uh, he also is neurodiverse, and he's a software tester now. And Neil Barnett runs the Autism Hiring Program at Microsoft in Seattle. We'll hook you up to any information. But meantime, Neil, Oliver, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Oliver, you should send us your resume. If you want to write down, I can give you my email. Okay, we'll let you guys go. <laughs> and th- thank you both so much. Hire him. That was a uh, beautiful story there. Um, uh, something I've never heard before, but this is new, new territory now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Companies are beginning to widen up their scopes. These are two beautiful uh, uh, reports that I just shared with all of us that listen to this program. If anything else, take this away. Um, my sister, Aisha Dujalo, has a, an autistic child. Uh, many of us do. There are programs that they've had with the people in the UK. Um, there are companies now that are looking at the enormous knowledge and talent that these uh, or overlooked or underlooked young men and women uh, or older folks have. And Oliver's story stands out. Uh, and Microsoft is just beginning. I mean, so uh, if you have a child that is got autistic challenges, it's time to look out and reach out to Microsoft and find out how you can prepare your child for these opportunities. Again, the interview as the human resources, they have a kind of, you know, kind of up their game to begin to kind of understand. So the interviews are usually set in stone. They're looking for pasture. They're looking for answers. They're looking for how you articulate yourself. And unfortunately, we talked about comprehension and reading. Yes, that's important. But other people have certain challenges. And the worst of our challenge in Africa is, first of all, looking at this demographic as people who are non-entities. That's true. We do that a lot. Uh, Somebody has a disability, you think, that's the dumbest person on earth. These are some of the smartest people. I can share stories from when I was in Michigan and over here. I have a kid now that I've worked with from the previous school I was to this school now. If she sits down and starts to draw, you would think that's the best artwork you've ever seen. And she's in fifth grade. We had a student in Michigan um, who is autistic. Uh, One of the smartest students is all straight A's. Yes, she does get special needs support, but she doesn't need a lot of help. Just soft touch assistance to make sure that she focuses. And they, they're very, very kind of um, sensitive to so many things, the lighting, the sound, and all the other things. So for the specialists who, who focus on helping these children, they know what the things are that they don't like, that disturbs them. And if you can, if you can tap into that talent as they age, Imagine what benefits they can bring to a company. So neurodiverse candidates, yes, these are young men and women who are just as capable. Look at this guy. Master's degree in math, autistic, and 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 listen to him. So if he talks to you today, you may think this person can't articulate themselves. They're They're just as bright, perhaps brighter than other people. I think the next other equation would be how do you put them in the context of working in a corporate company, a corporate company where there's just so fast movement? If a company can accommodate somebody like that and understand that they're not fast paced, they work at their own time, there are certain things that they like, there are certain things that they're sensitive to, they can take companies from one point, one step to another based on the knowledge that they have. They're very smart. Uh, I mentioned about that young lady in Michigan she sings too. If you hear her sing and you didn't see her, you wouldn't believe this young lady is autistic. These are gifted people all over. Every young 
man or man and woman or young girl and boy that I have come across that is autistic turns out to be one of the brightest students you would ever find and so uh, we're going to wrap this up on the issue of education and social issues and we're going to segue into our home country Gambia in a few minutes here uh, brother Ibrahim Asisi will be calling in uh, and then we'll uh, talk about everything else uh, from politics that's their expertise and everything that surrounds the importance of what we need for our country uh, moving forward so uh, we'll take a quick break here, and when we come back, uh, we'll continue uh, the program uh, Africa Focus on Education here uh, on the FATU Network. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, as we were talking, my uh, young brother, uh, Pasering, also said um, uh, some more information about schools and universities. Turns out Starbucks is also offering a sweet, uh, similar tuition reimbursement program or so to speak with Arizona State University so a lot of these companies I mean once a company starts something and they have benefit from it and the news uh, wires reported and everybody is going to be going towards that because these are investments and I think companies can write these off on their taxes because they're making a difference in the young men and women who work for them so it's an investment that's going to come back and bring reward for them um, but then again, this begins to narrow, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough, it actually begins to narrow the options of Africa, really beginning to attract talent, uh, your young men and women who are overseas in other companies or other countries. Uh, unless you begin to fix your education system and your institutions, you're not going to be able to have the talent that you need, because these companies are now beginning to use other ways to keep these employees uh, and you cut you start playing around some of these companies probably would go to Africa and start doing the same thing um, so we need to get our act together which brings us to this segue of talking about our problems uh, so in a minute here Ibrahim Asisi will call and perhaps Abdul Sigisar uh, would be home uh, in a little bit and then he'll call in and I hope for I look forward to having brother MB Krubali hopefully he's feeling better the call in because we have a lot of things we want to talk about. We're talking about QTV's decision not to broadcast broadcast the interview they had with Coach Pastor Majau and um, <coughs> Dr. Cisse, and then uh, you know thank God uh, for having Tukulor C. Sister Tukulor C goes out and gives a blast, and and it turns out now the story is they had some technical glitches and they'll broadcast this next week. I mean. Uh, Muhammad Ja, I know Muhammad Ja. Um, he and I went to Muslim high school. He seniored me by a year. Uh, I'm a little disappointed, and I have been, uh, but then again, I don't know, uh, because during the Jame era, there were a lot of things that uh, supposedly he partnered and, and helped yeah, Jame, but we understand that was back then. This is a new era. Muhammad Ja does not need to you know, cozy up with Adam Abaro. His wealth and whatever he's got, President Adam Abaro didn't give him that wealth. I mean, Mohamed Ya went to school, luckily his family and all of the things happened to him, especially during that time of the 22 years. So if he has survived that and he understands that people still have concerns about his connection with Yaya Jami, how his business came about, but he survived that. I think this is a good time for him to cleanse himself from getting involved in any of these government uh, issues. Politics, yes, because you're doing business. You need to make sure that uh, you can reach out to the government and see whatever programs you can have. But, you know, to cancel a program and not broadcast it because people are kind of, uh, they're not insulting to the president. They're just telling them, the, the government, that they don't like the direction they were headed. And the least you can do is just broadcast it. Why would you censor your network, a new TV station that's just up? You look at DRTS, they're suffering because, again, the diaspora, yes, you can say all you want about us, but sometimes when the diaspora likes a certain thing, especially programs that happen and they watch it, you would see people, you know, make comments, positive comments on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
And they'll, they'll call their families back home and tell them, we like this program, we watch it. And GRTS was making inroads uh, a few months back. And I think when Ibrahim um, uh, <coughs> left, uh, no, Ibrahim, sorry, when he left and became the minister and all of these programs that were kind of, you know, challenging. These are not programs that were, they were kind of, you know, uh, derogatory in, in tone. They were, people were just saying how they felt uh, about the government because people have suffered so much. And then they started censoring some of these programs. Well, the ratings, I mean, I, I don't watch GRTS anymore. I'm being honest because I just don't see uh, them being an independent entity. GRTS is funded by public funds or tax money. So it should be independent. But then when you have these independent entities that are private owned TV stations really starting to act like that, then you're concerned. So these people are raising their concerns about our government and how they feel. Uh, and I think it needs to be broadcasted. That doesn't mean Mohammed Jai is going down there saying Adam Obaro is doing that, no. I mean, yes, you can control some of the things that people are saying, but if you have a network that invites Pasa Majao and Dr. Sisi, you should know what to expect from them. And then to censor it and then come back and talk about technological glitches or whatever. I mean, anyway, uh, that's too much politics. But um, uh, when these guys call, they'll talk about all of these things, um, how the politics of today is affecting our MOU, uh, the National Development Plan and all of those equations that, uh, that are of concern to all of us. Um, so, I mean, uh, Ibrahim just called, so let's uh, have a listen. What are Ibrahim? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, nui nala. No problem. No problem. Wow, you get Santa Yala. Where have you mom? Alhamdulillah, I'm a good snow, but very not. Then, since we may since first snow a few weeks back, about a month and a half ago, then, day, and if I said that, I got out, Timmy, you make a 43 degrees. How now, said it to the but Santa Yala, Buba, happy new year to you. Happy new year to you, Agnip. I saw it, I'm Balamari, and I'm in America, I'm in the Munio Buff Snow, but if I'm your name, what I'm saying, when you're tougher. เออเดี๋ยวมึงเงินกูเดี๋ยวเออเงินเอาเงินเลยสุภาพว่าเลยเกี่ยวกับเรื่องวอลีวายนี่นักมุ่งเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเนี
Ya Sol aga Abdullah aga Abdul ini pergi mana mana yang mana Oh okay. Wah 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 wah. Lima lagi kali. Mana yang mana fei si lingkaran yang dikontribut sahaja ham akses time ag Abdul ag Sol. Kita mula dengan fei lingkaran def lingkaran def yang kuda faham ini. Orang kuaya lah yang lah fei fei yang ni dek lupa. Amen. Allahumma amin. You're telling me another yalla you know. Um, all the things that uh, you've been contributing all these uh, past few months and years, you know, they've been really helpful. So. Jere jepe kaya balangi na kunti ne pastoring ya Ibrahim. Elik would be three years uh, we've been doing this. Uh, you guys joined me probably halfway into it. For three years, you get a you get a program. Being it tomorrow would be January the sixth, the very day, be my launch a program. Be Africa Focus and Education. Then, Muslim ma bay Muslim ma bay kanaw na yow. Yang edem school, yang eligay, but every once in a while, dinga yow. A very education. We've said so many clips here about families, student loans, financial aid. Because you have expertise, you brought that young guy from Gambia. Nga hamne mo get so many great things. In our community, for Funo, Ngawatan Lulu, what's happening in your community? The network in Bingane Karidev, Ibrahim, the mayor, Ham Ham, see a very oil industry. I have never had knowledge about the oil industry except fee. Why expertise, Isi, Abdul, talking about technology, your time the medical field, all of those things, Lulu Mota, Monak. So, when I see Ligi, I see the daylight out of me, I get exhausted. Why? So, my halati, in direct. And the expertise being in a being in a easy. So my talk if him Friday night, man, elect for you to program be dal because these people. Pas kita nyonya dem be ega time bo hamne hejna ring kumuno continue. Wa yala nyonya la me nyumun ko continue. Lep lu nyonya watan fi munge jering nini. Sir Ibrahim kera ulumwa. Mane magambi nini nyonge am access to all kinds of information. Nini nini dende ham what is going on? People are more informed today. Than they were before. The lulu moita government began a ragal. So government be started the ragal nini moitu lunyo adef. That is what is going to bring advancement in Rio. Doi time bo bunun so gisay nyo dan muna challenge jawara. Balawa li man mangro legacy intelligence agency. Why is nje mesi send campaign ni ngahan nyo nyo adef political rallies. We always standing around doi the observe lunyo wa. So guy oje wa nako. So guy gisay guy di nyo rek. You know, ah, what do I have to do? This is not the case of the Sireo. The government has to talk to the marginalized. They have to talk to them. They have to talk to them. So, they have to talk to them. 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 So, I want to talk to them. Thank you for being able to talk to the contribute to the community. We have to talk to them. We have to talk to them as we move along. Thank you. Thank you. Pas pasering yang mana dia? Muna muna hamdah view mute. Hello pasering. Ada dia soal wow. Wow, muna ganyo hamdah view mute because of tinggal negara. Nyu melang gawa ngah throw in your your expertise. Hamdah ada yang dia busy. Wow. Yeah, sure. Mangi ni job ni sade. Nampak just a few minutes ni ada. No. Yeah, but the thing that I want to talk about more. Seems like I'm really echoing really bad now. Wow, young man! Don't need you to them. Why? Sometimes it'll take a minute or a few seconds, but I'm more stabilized. Okay, okay. Then you're glad, Ega. Okay, yeah. I have got the things that I really wanted to emphasize. It has something to do with Gambia, but also Africa as a whole. I mean, and it has to do with economics and finances. Mm-hmm. Ne. Um, for us to start kind of looking at things also from the financial perspective as well, you know, when it comes to the Gambia, because we have seen what this recent budget has taught us and what, what we have seen from this, you know, and all the chaos that happened because of the 2019 budget and the supplementary, you know, act we're going to pass. Wow. You know, so I think it should be an eye opener. 
for us not just to focus our, our politics, not, not just on these personalities only, these politicians, you know, but let's look at that, the institutions that are actually running our country. And the economics of it has a lot to do with it, you know, especially the macroeconomic, you know, aspect of it, you know, the government, you know, fiscal policies and the monetary policies, you know, because these are the things that actually move our country. Because when you talk about these things, you are talking about the GDP. You know, you are talking about, you know, the ease of doing business, you know, and all of these things that uh, foreign investors will be looking at before they decide to invest in the Gambia. Because you have to understand that we are competing with 53 other nations in Africa. Absolutely. You know, and we are ranked. We are ranked at the very bottom. So if a Microsoft wants to come, you know, they're going to look at 53 other countries. You know, what is it that will attract them to the Gambia? Right now, not much. You know, and these big multinational companies, they come in and they bring a lot of employment with them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just want the average Gambian just to start looking at our our politics from that perspective as well. There's nothing wrong with, you know, scrutinizing, you know, what the government is doing, you know, and those kind of things. But we, we also need to look at the macroeconomic, you know, point of view as well, you know, so that we will all be aware because the more we are...